Many suburbs of Soweto, South Africa's largest township, now house an emerging middle class. But tens of thousands still live in shacks. With no access to electricity, these shack dwellers rely on fossil fuels for heating and cooking, which often leads to accidental fires, resulting in horrendous burns for many of the victims. Over two-thirds of burns in South Africa are caused by these dangerous practices, and 80% of the fatal injuries occur in informal settlements. In winter, when temperatures drop below freezing, the burns unit at Chris Hani Baragwanath Hospital routinely has to deal with the terrible repercussions of this problem. We'll do the rounds with uh, severe burn patients. We've got uh, four cubicles here, and then we'll go to the ward and see um, other patients that have been there for uh, many weeks. We do see three type of injuries here. Accidental burns, which is about two-thirds of all our admissions. Suicide attempt, which is about five to six percent per year. And uh, the rest is due to assault. Burn specialist Dr. Adeline Muganza and Dr. Vaneshri Chetty examine a young man burnt and beaten during the xenophobic attacks on non-South Africans in June 2008. Uh, difficult case, eh? Because he doesn't have uh, enough skin. This young man suffered third-degree burns over most of his body. He had some procedures in theatre, and then he's still having the fracture to be fixed. We put priority first on, uh, on burns. Over 80 people died and thousands were displaced in the countrywide assaults. But these areas did take, eh? You can just yes. take out all the other clips. Yes, it did. Yes. Yes. Okay, good. But I'm surprised that they wound uh, so nice and clean. So nice clean, because this was very deep. Yeah, no, it was a very deep yeah. Valdush survived the attack, but will live with the repercussions forever. Adeline came to South Africa from the Democratic Republic of Congo. I worked for the first time in this uh, unit. It was in 1993. I came as a junior doctor. I was very fascinated by uh, the way I saw burns wounds covered with a skin graft. Burns is not a popular profession. It's a time consuming. With burns, you must be very patient. You can have this patient for years and years coming back to you. Most accidents are poverty related, often around fires for heating, as in the case of this young boy and his two friends. The boys lit a tire to keep warm on a cold Joburg night. They were lighting a fire and they threw diesel at it and the flames oh, came back to them. So yeah. it was accidental burns? Yeah. Okay. And they were two. What is the other? The other? Adeline checks two on the other boys in the, injured in the injured. fire. Uh, in the wood, okay. What happened to you? It's the, the tie. The tie. You are feeling cold, eh? Yes. I think I think he'll do well, except uh, on this area he's having some slough. Uh, we can put any uh, the slough figure agent. Is it the the third one, eh? Okay. All right. Okay. These boys and numerous others will be recovering in the burns unit for many months. As will Adeline's next patient, Peter, who ran into a burning shack to rescue a baby trapped inside. There was a fire in a shack and there was a baby in the shack and he ran in to try to rescue this baby. He caught fire in the process, sustaining a partial thickness burns to his head, uh, face mostly, and his hands. So he's on day four admission. Yeah. We need to bronchoscope him, mm -hmm. but we're not planning to take him to theater. So we don't need to do any surgical intervention there just yet. That's good. Well done. Good. Sure. I mean, he'll just have a... Jim is another shack fire victim and is being assessed in the treatment room. He's had skin grafts to his legs. I was in my room sleeping. Uh, after one hour, 30 minutes, I just <clears throat> smell some smoke. Uh, when I wake up, I found that uh, my room is burning. 
I didn't know how. I don't know how. That's how I get burned. So we did a skin graft here. The second quad 12 system. Yeah. Even on the, on the knee, yeah? yeah? I think what we need to do now is to remove all these clips. Um, so we're quite satisfied, and then we're planning on the other wounds. Uh, like the scalp, we want to do it tomorrow, to put another skin graft on the back. All right. Otherwise, it's, it's doing well. After finishing rounds, Adeline returns to perform a bronchoscopy on Peter, the man who saved the baby from the burning shack. What I'm going to do now is uh, to clean the bronchoscopy. This procedure entails the, putting a small camera into the airway uh, to assess the damage caused by smoke inhalation. In a bronchoscopy uh, is a test that we do to see the extent of the injury to give us a, a good idea of uh, what we're dealing with. Okay, and um, what you can see, we are already in the airway. This should be the lower airway. And then if you push again. Sorry, Peter. Okay, Frank. Yeah, it's going to cough a little bit, it's not a problem. It's got uh, some inflammation and a lot of secretion. This white, this stuff you see are secretions. Okay. You need to pay attention to details. Those small details can actually uh, make a big difference in the outcome of the patient. Okay. The procedure reveals that the prognosis is good and Peter is expected to make a quick recovery. After tomorrow, we can remove him from this uh, intensive care uh, place so that uh, we can prepare the uh, cubicle to receive another patient. On the other side of Barra lies the trauma unit, struggling to operate from temporary facilities. They deal with all surgical emergencies and resuscitations. It is midweek and the trauma unit is unusually quiet, but doctors like Patrick know that anything can happen at any time. You can never say it's quiet. You never know what's gonna come in. The doctor from Ireland, Patrick is nearing the end of his nine-month contract at Barra, one of the world's busiest trauma units. He hears an urgent case has just arrived. Uh, a seven-year-old child coming in has already intubated at the scene with a head injury, plus a minus other injury. The girl and her mother were on the pavement outside their home when an unlicensed driver crashed into the child. When paramedics arrived at the scene, Sunishka was unconscious and bleeding heavily from the mouth. GCS was three. Lost respiratory effort five minutes after I got on the scene. Let's get him onto the vent, eh? This is a seven-year-old girl who's been hit by a car outside her house. Watch out. Watch. Gertrude, can we get her onto our ventilator, please? Yeah, but the ventilation It's giving you problems. Yeah. Okay. In that case, do you want to go at the top end, mate, just and, and to, to bag Patrick until we get quickly our grasps the severity okay? of the situation. Her coma score is three out of fifteen, which is as low as it gets. Not looking good for this poor girl, is it? It's not looking good for her. It's fine. What's the problem with the vent, Ida? Can we use the other vent then? Okay. Thanks. Just having a problem with the equipment, it's not working, as usual. <coughs> At the moment, it looks like this child's predominant probably is a major head injury. Um, we're just getting some x-rays at the moment. We need to wait on those to decide what else to do. Oh, we just changed over the other ventilator. It, uh, it's just not ideal for ventilating a child on that. So we changed ventilators and it seems to be working. Any relatives at the scene? Shut our way here. Patrick finds Sanishka's mother waiting anxiously outside the resuscitation room. He briefs her on her daughter's serious condition. I think her head injury is the major issue, okay? And at the moment, she's very, very unconscious. She's in a deep coma, okay? And I expect that she's got a major head injury and she likely has major brain damage, okay? It may be that she will not survive this, okay? All right. 
I'm sorry. Is there someone with you? Yeah, my neighbor. I'm sorry, okay? Yeah. It's too early to tell yet, but she looks like she's got a very big injury. So now we must just wait. At Barra's trauma unit, doctors are struggling to save the life of a seven-year-old girl who has sustained massive head injuries after a hit-and-run accident. I'll let you do it because my gloves are dirty. So we're just checking to see if there's any open wounds that are still bleeding that we could stop the bleeding, but I can't see anything. I think the chance of this child surviving or having any meaningful sort of outcome is very, very slim. Suddenly, Sunishka's heart stops. Ask him to get the blood if he's not already getting it. Blood, blood for the child. Okay. Could someone bring over the defibrillator for us, please? And let's dial up 90 joules, please. Sanishka is not responding to resuscitation, so and the nurses that. are still Just struggling with the equipment. Okay? Give this kid 20 breaths a minute, okay? You feel anything? Yeah. Right, three minutes, let's reassess. Okay, I'm going to speak to the mother, and if the mother wants to see the resuscitation, I'm going to bring her in, okay, so that you're aware that a mum will be coming in, okay? At the moment, we're breathing for her with the bag and we're doing some chest compressions, okay? okay. We'll do everything we can, but it doesn't can look I like we'll be able to restart. Sure. Can everyone stand clear? We are going to shock. Okay. Make sure mommy and daddy stand clear, please. Okay, I'm charging 100. Okay. Okay, let's just continue CPR. Please put the paddles back for me. Okay. You understand what's happening here. Her heart is still not restarted. Okay. Okay, you'll try your people's best. You're doing good. Okay. Can we just stop everything again? Continue to bag for me, please. is still not restarted. I don't think we can save your daughter. I'm very sorry. Okay. So we're giving her another few minutes. It won't change the outcome. At this stage, we're kind of treating ourselves and treating the mother the more than we're treating the child. Nothing. Okay. Okay, we're going to call it. Thank you very much, everyone, for your efforts. Okay. Time of death, 1715. Let's turn off everything. Okay. Look, I'm sorry, there was nothing more we could do for her, okay? <laughs> Parents usually want to be present when she wanted to come in. I think it gave her an opportunity to accept that her child has died because she saw the reality of it. In this child's case, it was obvious to us that the child really had very little chance of survival. And a lot of what we were doing was treating the mum in the end. You get very used to it. Just, uh, it's obviously more difficult when you've met the family beforehand and you're uh, involved with them, but happens every day here, so. I need a break as well. Being in here almost every day for nine months is um, time for a change, time for a break. Patrick plans to work with the medical humanitarian agency, Médecins Sans Frontières, or Doctors Without Borders. 
which provides emergency medical assistance to populations in need. He recently heard his posting will be to Pakistan on the Afghan border. Yeah, I'll definitely miss this place, yeah. And I'd like to come back and work here again. I'd particularly like to work in the new place, in the new resource room. Barra is currently undergoing extensive reconstruction. The first two phases include new casualty and trauma units. The new build and the new facilities are long overdue and will be just such a difference that it's, I mean, that's the main motivation for me coming back to work here is to see the difference and to work in the new facility. The construction is part of Barra's revitalization program, aimed at improving facilities, infrastructure and equipment. We will attract more overseas staff and we'll also attract more local staff because it's hard work in this place, in these suboptimal conditions, but everybody has to do some sacrifices for a better future, and this is our future. And it's going to be state of the art, as simple as that. The best in the world. This is the ambulance bay. This is the entrance to casualty, entrance to trauma. So that's it, it's massive. The new building will radically improve the ability of staff to treat their patients, who are currently on the receiving end of poor service delivery and staff shortages. In this area, we've got 11 examination bays, and uh, then we've got the new resuscitation area. It's 200 square meters large, and everything in here is paperless, computerized. It's going to be the most modern resuscitation area in South Africa and one of the most modern sustainable areas in the world. Let's go to theater. At least your wishes come true. In the Burns unit, Adeline is preparing to operate on a repeat patient, Mary. He will be using a new artificial skin grafting technique. Adeline works hard to ensure that his patients receive the most advanced treatments available although they don't always fall within the budget. It is a very expensive um, skin, very expensive. You know, this is a new technique. This is one of the best inventions seen in uh, Burns management, but uh, it's the first time that we're using this uh, technique here. Mary's accidental burns on her arm were caused by boiling water. No, no. She was burnt about two years ago and then she didn't come for her follow-up rehab. So what happened is her elbow contracted and subsequent to that she lost her job. She had difficulties in combing her hair, getting food to the mouth, activities of daily living because her elbow was literally stuck like that. So what we did on that side is we released the contracture. We used a, a new skin, uh, a dermal substitute and uh, straightened out the elbow. And now we're just going to do the last phase of the operation which is covering the area. We remove all these uh, clips and remove the uh, top layer and then uh, use a, a skin. Vaneshri removes a layer of skin from Mary's leg to graft over her inner elbow. Are you going to mesh it? Uh, yeah. Okay. It. To make it a little bigger. Yeah. Okay. We're just stretching the skin so we can mesh it. Try and get it as even as possible. The skin is then meshed to allow it to stretch over larger areas. New skin will grow and cover the entire wound. We are an academic institution, so everything that we're doing here, um, we need to document um, for teaching purposes as well. Um, that's how we're taking pictures to present as well and then to, to evaluate as well. Yeah. What uh, kept me here is actually teaching. Yeah. Yes. Yes. For a state-run hospital like Barra, finding the money for new treatments and technologies is always a battle. The funding is always a problem. It depends on the way you motivate. Sometimes people confuse cheap dressing and then uh, effective dressing. 
if there is a good dressing, which is expensive, it's better to, to use that. It's beneficial for the patient and uh, for the health system. I don't you keep seeing the same patient all the time. Look, sometimes we do, uh, we do fight. Eh? Sometimes we, we go to uh, the point of uh, treating to, to, to resign or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Just for the patient. OK, look, uh, we're happy uh, with this procedure. We're going to do another case. Now we have, we have to, to start our fight with uh, administration to get uh, the product uh, in the unit. By using the new skin grafting technique and new dressing, Mary's recovery and rehabilitation time will be greatly reduced, enabling her to go back to work and restart her life. It's Patrick's last shift at Barrow. In the trauma unit, the staff prepare a farewell party for him. So this is my last day in Barra. This is hopefully our um, last stab chest that I'm going to see. And uh, I'm going to go and have a cup of tea with the sisters now. Say goodbye. Yeah, I'm a little bit sad. I think one of the nicest things about this job is sort of the relationship we've managed to have with the nurses. I think they've been amazing. Eh? They're really warm people, and uh, it's the bit I enjoy most about the job now is coming in in the morning and chatting with them. On behalf of the trauma staff, trauma emergency staff, we're going to miss him, Patrick, his patience, his kind. You will really be missed. Anna. will remember him, and she, she knows each, each and everybody who's working here by name. <laughs> Make a promise to come back to us, mm. to the new building. You're supposed to be there for us and forever. Thanks very much, eh? I'm ready for, for a rest, but I'm a bit sad as well. Hope I'm going to come back and work here again. I'd like to come back at some stage. David, man. Pat, how are I want you? to miss you. Do I feel that I've made a difference in Barra? No, I think Barra's taught me far more than I've taught it.